Please stand with me as we continue our worship with the three quarters of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We exist against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn.
just read Psalm 16 responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out for you offerings to such gods, and never take their names on my lips. O Lord, for my portion, my God, it is you who will hold my lot. My boundaries is full of the blessed land, and indeed I have a rich I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me, because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart therefore is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. We will not have any to pray, nor let the Holy One see the bed. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Reading from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice when, with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Believing, you may have life in his name. 
the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I suppose there are many definitions of what a Christian is. I think in view of this text and in view of the Easter season, I would say a Christian is a person who believes that God raised Jesus from the dead. From Easter morning until now, the physical resurrection of Jesus has been a matter of contention when the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill preached Jesus' resurrection from the dead in Acts 17, he was greeted with hoots of derision by those who listened to him. The pagan world still mocks and laughs at this central Christian belief. Even Jesus' disciples knew doubt, as we observed in today's gospel lesson. Thomas said he wouldn't believe unless the risen Christ stood in front of him and he could put his fingers in the nail prints and put his hand in his side. The risen Christ did just that. Thomas believed. The Holy Spirit wants you and me to believe too. Without belief in the resurrection, there would be no Gospels. There would be no church. And there would be no Christians. There would be no Christ followers. No historian doubts this. Yet the story of Thomas' doubt is a reminder of the absurdity of the resurrection happening in the context of human history and in human time. First century people may not have been scientific as we understand scientific thought today, but they understood death, and they knew that the dead do not rise to new life. In every age, the belief in Jesus' resurrection must overcome prior prejudice of such things happening because it runs counter to our everyday experience about life and about death. I mean, even Jesus raising Lazarus or Jairus' daughter from the dead, those were not resurrections. They were resuscitations. I mean, when somebody dies of a heart attack and they're able to get to that person quickly and they hit them with the defibrillator, the paddles, and they killed their heart, and they were dead, clinically dead, for maybe moments or minutes, and they shot them back to life. Would you say, that person was resurrected? No. You'd say, he or she was resuscitated, and that's quite right. Why? Because if you're resurrected, you'll never die again. If you're resuscitated, you are going to die at some point in time again. Lazarus was dead in the tomb four days. Jesus resuscitated him, brought him back to life. And Lazarus had the pleasure of dying again at some point in his life. He died twice, physically. Jesus is the first fruits of, of the resurrection. That means he's the first one to be resurrected and have a resurrected body, a forever body. He, he, Jesus was not incarnate forever. In the beginning with the Father, He was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were spirit. Jesus became incarnate of the Virgin Mary. And now His incarnation, He has a new resurrected body. And His incarnation is, for, his incarnation is forever. He'll always be the incarnate Christ. But He's the first fruits of those to be resurrected. In fact, Jesus rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits, fulfilling that feast. He, he fulfilled three feasts, three his feasts, when he died, was buried, and rose again. He fulfilled all of those three feasts. When he comes back, he'll fulfill the rest of them. But for now, he's fulfilled three of them. You know, like it or not, here is our Easter faith. We believe against natural tendencies to disbelieve in the resurrection of Jesus as a bodily resurrection. In the Apostles' Creed, we confess that we believe in the resurrection of the body. The ground of this confession is our, confession is our belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus wasn't raised, then neither can we be raised, for there would be no resurrection of the dead. By raising Jesus, God put his imprimatur on who Jesus is, his life, his teaching, 
that he is the Son of God, his death for our sins, and he raised him up to say, this is my Son. He died for you. I rose, I raised him from the dead, gave him that commandment that he could rise from the dead, so that you might know that he is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. Now we hold the resurrection against two common misunderstanding or tendencies. Now the first is to reduce Jesus rising uh, to a resuscitation, as I said earlier, uh, of a corpse. Jesus was not resuscitated. He was dead three days in the tomb. And he rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. Now the second is to spiritualize the event as though Jesus' spirit or soul was raised like a ghost, leaving his body or corpse behind. That wasn't true either. Jesus fully was resurrected in bodily form. His spirit and his body still together. And those things were important because those things were often taught and believed early in Christendom. That either Jesus was just resuscitated. There was one belief that said, well, yeah, he was crucified, but when he took him down, he was still alive, and somehow he, he regained his strength in the tomb, and then the disciples got him out, and then he appeared as if he was resurrected. That was a myth that went around in early times right after Jesus was resurrected. The other is, no, 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 he, he, his spirit rose, but the body was still dead. These were false teachings that circulated around. Then the Jewish people turned hierarchy just played out and said, no, 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 the disciples came, overcame the Roman guards, got Jesus out of the tomb, and now they claim he's resurrected. But they just stole his body and buried it someplace else where nobody could find him. There was a lot of opposition to believing that Jesus actually rose from the dead. For Paul, the resurrection meant new life in the body. Not to return to the same old life into a perishable physical body. Paul's picture is that of a seed growing into a plant. It is Jesus' earthly mortal body that is transformed into an immortal, imperishable body. Everything is new. Yet there's continuity between the crucified body of Jesus and the risen Son of God. Now what that means for me is good news, bad news. What it means is in your resurrected body, you're going to be young again if you're older like me. You're not going to be 62 or 80 or 75 or whatever age. You're going to be in the prime of life, whatever that is, maybe 30 years old. The bad news is for some of us, we're going to look like ourselves. But no, you know, no glasses, no, no business like that. But you're going to be recognizable. People look at you and say, yeah, you're you. That's you. And you'll be in a forever body, in a perfect place. A body that was meant to live and exist for eternity. Never growing old, never getting crotchety. Well, we might get crotchety, I can't say that to speak for you. But I mean, you know, you're always going to be full of light, full of joy, full of praise, full of, full of God's glory. And an intimate fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And with one another. It's more than we can even conceive, but we need at least... Think about how wonderful it's going to be. How many people have been said, you know, they, they, they don't think much of Christianity, and they wouldn't want to hang out with Christians for eternity. It'd be the worst thing they could ever think of doing. So they're, they're happy that God send them, it sends them to the other place. Now that's where all the fun people go. No. No. Absolutely not. They're going to be bereft of God's Spirit. Even the worst evil person on this earth is not bereft of God's Holy Spirit's presence in and around them in this world. Now you have the Holy Spirit living in you. In baptism, the Holy Spirit came to take up residence in you. So you are a living temple. You're a temple. God's Spirit dwells in you. That's why Paul says we're to take care of ourselves, watch out for ourselves. He said, don't you know that you're, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? And when you denigrate the degrade your third body purposefully, you denigrate the place where God's Spirit is dwelling. Well, not to do that. 
It's not that we're going to not grow older and someday we'll die, but we don't needlessly harm ourselves because of who God has created us to be, the vessel. And then we're like living stones, he said. Like, you know, that every, every one of us is a stone, and that stone is built into a holy temple, a holy habitation of the Lord. It's even beyond the individual. Collectively, we become the place where God dwells. It's a wonderful, marvelous image. And Paul paints that picture for us to give us an idea of, of what God has done for us and in us and continues to do even right now under this day. It's not an exaggeration to say that the entire structure of the Christian faith is hinged upon the fact that Jesus was raised by God from the dead. Who is God, we might ask? What is God up to in the world? Who are we as God's children? What are we supposed to be doing in His absence? All of these questions are answered through the resurrection. God is the one raised, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, Paul says in Romans 8, 11. Who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist, Romans 4, 17. Christians have no other God than the one who creates new life from the dead, Romans 11, 15. Likewise, the resurrection shapes and forms our worldview, how we see everything else in the world. We're not going to go out in the world and grab what the world believes and look at the Bible for our lives. We're going to take the Scriptures, our new life in Christ, everything we know about the Father, Son, and Spirit. That is our lens to look at the world, not vice versa. And yet many Christians take that lens of the world and try to look at their brothers and sisters in Christ and look at the Bible and look at their faith. It doesn't work. It skews everything. It's like, it's like, uh, you ever put on somebody's glasses and aren't your prescription? And you're like a blind person? They go, holy cow, they, 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 they grab those are your glasses. Where am I? You know, that kind of thing, you know? That's, that's what happens to us when we use the world's lens to look at our life in Christ. The church or our faith. Everything's out of line. Everything's wonky. Nothing is clear. It's all a mess. You gotta use the scriptures. And your life in Christ as the lens. So look at everything else in order to see it clearly. Remember in Matthew 28, Jesus did his disciples to go and in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. He gives us our marching orders. He tells us who we are, who we are to be in the world. He tells us who the people are we're to go love in His name and to teach them and to, to share the gospel with them and to help them understand if they're willing. Luther said, I can only get to a person's ears. It takes the Holy Spirit to move it from the ear to the heart. So we're not responsibility to create faith in someone. Only God, only the Holy Spirit can do that. But we are responsible to get the word to their ear so they can hear it. So they can see it lived out in your life, in living color, technicolor, so to speak, in your life, as God lives out his life in you. We live in an era of human history where there is uncertainty in churches, whether it is imperative to preach the gospel to people who don't share our faith or to people who have no visible faith at all. People will say, don't all religions say the same thing, only use a different language? Isn't it arrogant of us to think that we alone have the quote-unquote the truth? The answer to both of those is a resounding no, we're not arrogant. And no, not all faiths are equal. You know, if every faith is equal, do you know that means Christianity is not true? It's not true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Either that is true or it's false. And somebody other, you can't have somebody other's faith say, there's many roads to happen. You can get there by just being good. You can do this, you can do that. If that's true, then you shouldn't even be sitting here and listening to me. Because Christianity is false. Those religions, believe it or not, they're just as, they want you to believe what they believe. And they say, our way is right. Not over there, our way is right. Christians also say, Jesus is the way. He is God's eternal plan of salvation for not only human beings, but for the entire world to be redeemed and healed in the relationship with God the Father. 
And you say, well, that isn't fair. Really? Not fair? Why is it not fair? What would be fair is I would say, you know, i got a bad batch here. I'm just going to get rid of everybody and start over. And next time, maybe I'll do a better job. I'll make it a little different. I'll have a different mix. And people won't rebel against me, and they'll love me anyway. You could have said that. That would be fair. No, God provided us a way to come home. But here's the deal. You and I and all human beings that have ever lived have a free will. We're free moral agents. That means you can love God or you can go tell God to take a hike. That's what freedom means. Now, are there consequences for telling God to go take a hike? Absolutely. Are there consequences for us when we say, No, Lord Jesus, I want you to live in my heart. I want to follow you. I love you. Forgive my sins. Wash me in Jesus' blood. Yes, there are consequences. The consequence is you are now seen by God to be his daughter or his son. And he says, I know you. I've written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have eternal life in my son. More than that, I give you my spirit to live in your heart forever. That's the consequence. You are free moral agents. What you have been given is the right of rejection. You can't earn his love. You can't make things right because we've broken the relationship. God has made it right. What's unfair for God to say, I love you, I heal you in my relationship with my son? What is unfair about that? Well, I should be able to come any way I want. Oh, so you're still in your pride. You're still not humble enough to say, Father, not my will, your will be done. You're still saying what Adam and Eve said in the garden. No, Father, I want my will to be done, not yours. And you want to accept me any way I want to come. So there, you stick your tongue out of God. He says, no, I'm down no. That's not how it works here. You can do that if you want, but it's not going to go well for you. That's the way life is. God is love, but God is also holy. And He calls each of us to be holy. He is just. He is righteous. And He cannot abide sin, nor live with it, and won't. So He's done what only God can do. Make you righteous by the blood of the Son. So when He sees you, all the qualifications of being next to God are met. And he says, you belong to me now. You don't belong to the world anymore. You can't think the way the world thinks. You belong to me. You're a part of my family. And I love you. Without the resurrection, we couldn't say what I just said to you. Because of the resurrection, the world and you and me and all of those yet unborn who will be born have hope. You can take against the nose of it. Protest that you don't like the way God set things up. But all such protestations are avoided by God's action. In Jesus' resurrection, God speaks His word of unearned love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness to a rebellious and sinful humanity. And God offers us a foretaste of what He has in store for us, offering forgiveness and restoration, inviting us to die with Christ so that we might also rise with Christ to eternal life.
lines in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With joyful confidence, let us approach our Lord's throne of grace, there to pray on behalf of the Church, the world, and all people according to their need. Lord Jesus, bestow the light of your resurrection upon your church. Breathe your Holy Spirit upon it and fill it with your peace. Test and purify the church so that you are constantly praised, honored, and glorified in all it says and does. Use it to bring many to a sure and joyful faith in you, the author of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Breathe your Holy Spirit upon Christians who are persecuted for naming you as Lord, so that they act and speak in ways that glorify you. Soften the hearts of their enemies and cause many to believe in your strong, saving love. Give them the faith of the apostles who rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor on account of your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayer. Show yourself in mercy, forgiveness, and power to those who doubt, disbelieve, or have become disillusioned about the gospel of truth. Give to each of us such a gentle and encouraging spirit that we lead them closer to you. Give them simple, faithful words and loving, holy lives so that we do not become stumbling blocks in their journey from disbelief to saving faith in you, their Lord and God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Your glory is proclaimed in the heavens and throughout the universe, O oh Lord. Cause this world, so broken and wounded by sin, suffering, and sorrow, to also praise you. Turn every heart, especially the rulers of the nations, to seek your will. Bestow the spirit of counsel and might, so that we might accomplish it. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You breathe the spirit of peace upon those who trust in you, O Lord. But violence and destruction trouble our world. Keep watch, we pray, over all who stand in harm's way for the sake of protecting life and liberty. Give them courage and prudence and conform their decisions and deeds to your design. Bring healing and hope to them and their loved ones when they are wounded in body, mind, or spirit. May grant them a joyous homecoming when their task is done. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift before you everyone who is grieved by various trials to body, mind, heart, or spirit. We lift before your throne of grace our homebound, our church family and friends in need of healing, strength, and comfort. Those named in our bulletin, on our prayer chain, and those who we name aloud or in the quiet of our own hearts. Lead them safely through their suffering and restore them to life, hope, and love. And though they do not see you, give them grace to rejoice in your saving love for them, with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We entrust to you our risen and glorified Savior, all of our beloved dead. Comfort, we pray, all those whose grief runs deep, and fill our hearts with imperishable hope, lasting joy and unshakable confidence in the precious inheritance you have stored up for all who trust in you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we always encourage, forgive, and help one another and always overflow with love for you. And in your mercy, bring us 
with all whom you have redeemed into your presence, where we may gaze upon your glory and goodness, and may forever adore you, our Lord and God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I'd like to share Christ's own peace
do not get us with bread alone, but also with your word of grace. Bless us in the gifts which we have received from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you.
Sandra. The life of the Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive Him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to His through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.